everybody. A warm welcome to Wisdom from North, the Nordic platform for accelerated inner growth and empowerment. I'm Janneke, and if you're new to my channel, welcome here. I would love for you to subscribe. You do that below, and if you click the bell, you get notifications of my new videos. I also have a free meditation for you. It's called Meet Your Future Self. Check it out below. There you get to merge with a higher version of you. Now, today, I'm excited to be here with Will Polston. Will is one of UK's leading business strategists. He's a master coach and a master NLP practitioner. He is the founder of Make It Happen, and he has helped over 2,000 business owners and entrepreneurs. And today we're going to speak about how we can open up more to our potential and how life is for us and not against us. Hello, Will. How are you today? And welcome. I'm really well, thank you. And thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. I uh, am excited about uh, your journey because I know that you started out wanting to make a lot of money, wanting to be successful. And then your purpose and calling changed after having uh, a transformational experience uh, with Tony Robbins. So let's start there before we can go all places. Uh, absolutely. Well, um, I'll, I'll give you, um, I'll, I'll go back a few a few steps to, to make a, a bit more sense of it all. So I'm, I'm really fortunate. I don't have a Cinderella story. I've got an amazing um, mum and dad that are still together. I've got two sisters, a brother. Um, I always had shoes on my feet, clothes on my back, food in the fridge. We went on a holiday every year. I was really fortunate in that respect. But one of the things growing up that I really remember and was, was really vivid to me was how much my dad hated his job. So he used to leave at five o'clock in the morning, get home at seven, eight o'clock at night. He would bring the stress and frustration of work home with him. And I don't know if you can relate to ever being in a room with someone or being in someone's sort of environment where they've got so much going on. You can kind of feel the tension so much so that you don't want to be around them. And that's kind of what it was like sort of for me, me growing up my dad and certainly what I remember of it. Um, and that was the case for, for many, many years. And then one day I, I came home from school um, and my dad had quit his job to set up a business, one of my uncles. Now I've got two very wealthy uncles. One of them's a billionaire. The other one's a multi, multi-millionaire. And, and dad always used to say they just got lucky. So that was his thing. They just got lucky. They just got lucky. And long story short, that business never ended up doing what, well, it never even ended up getting started. But my dad had left his job. There were six of us in total, four kids and my mum and him. And then he fell into what we would call a depression. So he slept in the separate rooms with my mum, curtains shut all day, didn't leave the house, all the stereotypical things that you would expect from, from someone that's feeling depressed. And then my mum then had to go out and work like multiple different jobs to keep our roof over our head. And, and I was about 11 years old at this point. And then I started to connect the dots. And I was like, Uncle Mark, he's a billionaire. He's really happy. There's Uncle Steve. He's a multimillionaire. He's really happy. There's Dad when he works in London, right? He was stressed and frustrated, but he's a lot happier than he is now. He doesn't leave the house, right? So it's obvious money equals happiness. So that was the belief that I created at that moment, sort of connecting those dots. And then I went off on the tangent to make as much money as I could as early as I could. So I was the kid at school buying and selling sweets in the playground and doing whatever I could. And then that carried on. Um, at the age of 18, I got into investment sales. By the time I was in my late teens, I was making more money a month than most people earn a year. Um, at 18 was when I first stumbled across personal development. And for me, it was like, right, well, the more personal development I do, the more money I make. So I'll just do more personal development for, for that reason. And then it was eight years ago, um, I went to a Tony Robbins event and I had what I call my lightning moment. And it was actually when Tony was sharing the Thanksgiving story. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Thanksgiving story, but people can go on YouTube and Google it. It's a, a really, really powerful story. And then, bam, it hit me. And I just cried my eyes out for 15 minutes. And it, it was in that moment that I realized that my whole belief for the 10 plus years, 12 plus years prior to that, that money equals happiness was not true. And money doesn't equal happiness. But what it was really about was my dad. 
and how my dad hadn't achieved what he was capable of in the impact that had on him and my mum and me and my family and a whole host of other people. And it was in that moment, I just had this overwhelming feeling of like gratitude and joy and I, I just can't even, it was like, if you imagine a movie like where they, they, they the, the, the clouds part and the sun comes beaming down. It's like one of those moments for me, even though we were inside the, a, a big, big room. And from that moment, I vowed, I don't want other people to have to go through the suffering that, that he went through and we went through. And, and I made that decision in that moment, right? I'm going to become, um, at the time, I, I said, I wanted to become the world's best life coach. That's not my goal now, but it was in, in that moment because I wanted other people to, to not have to go through those, those challenges um, that, that he went through. And, and that kind of sent me off on that trajectory. And, and then life was never the same again from that moment. And, uh, and yeah, so that, that was the, the moment where it all shifted and it all changed. Wow, fascinating story. And I think uh, many people I interview have these big shifts, like, uh, and it's always so interesting to hear that transformation. And I, I, and I think it's not a coincidence. Uh, and you also say that it's not about you. W what do you mean by that? Well, so I, I did a TED talk um, or a TEDx talk a, a few years ago with, with this philosophy. So my, my mission now in life is I want to inspire a billion people to transform excuses into results and live a life that they love. Now, I, I'm not naive enough to think that I'm going to work with a billion people directly. But what I do believe is that by me working with the people that I do work with, by them achieving their full potential, they can benefit not only themselves, but their family, their friends, their community, society, humanity, the universe. It's what I call the ripple effect. I'm constantly referring to the ripple effect. And what, what a, a lot of people do, in my opinion, is they get so caught up with themselves partly because of they've never been taught to operate in any other way. Um, and, and partly because they just kind of get caught in their ego or whatever, is that they, they make things about themselves. Whereas we can do so much more when we make things about other people. You know, when we when we realize that the actions that we're taking today, if we take action A or action B could positively or negatively impact somebody else, then we would always take the option of taking the option, whichever A or B it is, that is going to have a, a more of a positive impact on others. And that, that in itself is a form of accountability and a form of leverage. And when you combine that with something that truly inspires you, then you, you, you have this renewable energy source that some people call inspiration, passion, whatever you want to label it as, that enables you to just go and go and go and go. And that's where it then doesn't become about you. Like I wake up every day thinking about the people that I could potentially impact. And that is the thing that, that, that fires me up now. It's not about, and I, it, you, you may, have, or may, may have heard a moment ago, I said, when I, in that moment, I decided I wanted to become the world's best life coach. That's not my goal now, because me becoming the world's best life coach was about me, right? Whereas now, my intention wasn't that, but the language that I was using was about me being the world's best life coach. See, that wasn't what I really wanted, but I just had no way of articulating that any different. Whereas now my goal is to inspire a billion people. And some people say to me, well, why, why a billion then? What's the, what's the point in having a billion? Well, the honest truth was it was a million and things weren't going the way that I really wanted them to go. And I thought to myself, what would I be doing differently today if my goal was a billion? And and I was like, well, I could do this, this, and this differently. So I get accelerated results. So I said, well, why don't I just do that? So it's it, it, it's just a number that gives me, me something to aim for. I'm a, I'm a big believer in having a goal that's so big, you never achieve it within your lifetime. Because if you have a goal that's so big that you never achieve it within your lifetime, you can detach from the outcome and focus on the process. You can get your fulfillment from the process. And that that way you find yourself in a a, a, a uh, a better position anyway, in my opinion. Um, and also it puts you in a position whereby you can um, have what, what I refer to as a North Star, which is that goal that's so big that you've just got a trajectory that you can follow and, um, and, and then able to, like I say, enjoy that journey along the way. Wow, that's interesting. Uh, there's many things, Sarah, I, I want to dive into, uh, but let's take the last first. So you don't think for 
uh, for, we, we spoke a little bit about the um, the difference between men and women um, before we started this interview that some women struggle more with negative self-talk and they're not so, you know, I'm just going to do it. And it seems like men have more confidence in doing it. Do you think that can also be a bit like uh, that we get that feeling that, oh, the, the goal is too wide. I'll never get there because we don't know the how. So we, it can sort of be demotivating because uh, a big goal like that can just be frightening to me. And I can have that little troll saying, ha ha, you're never going to make it. Great, great question. Well, let, let me share with you an another part of the story that you probably don't know. So I, I set this goal of I'm becoming the world's best life coach, right? And I went home that Sunday night, I sat my family down and I told my family, this is what I'm going to do. And that night I registered a company online. And the next day I went into the bank and I set up a company bank account and then I did nothing. <laughs> right? And then I did nothing. Right. So for, for me, I, I, I said, well, I'll do it when I'm successful right? It's what I call when then syndrome. A lot of people have when then syndrome. When this happens, then that happens, right? So when this happens, then I'll be happy. Or when this happens, then I'll do something or whatever it is. So I, I decided that. Anyway, I, I did take some action, which was I left. So I used to run a division of a stock brokerage in London. I left that. I set up a renewable energy business. We grew that. I mean, we grew rapidly um, in a very short period of time. And then over here in the UK, the government changed legislation. It pretty much killed that business overnight. I went on holiday with a girlfriend of mine at the time and um, I'll, I'll give you the short version because there's an extended version. Um, no, do you know what this is? I, I know you're more spiritual, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm going to give, I'm, I'm going to give you the more spiritual version. I, I said this to you before and, and, and I, um, I I'm, I'm a big, big believer that life happens for you, not to you. And I believe that everything um, that, that's happening is, is happening on the way. It's not in the way. And so I, I, I tell you exactly what happened. So I had a girlfriend at the time who's a dental nurse. And she said to me, um, Will, um, we're going on holiday. Go, let, let, go and get your teeth um, seen by the hygienist. Make them all really nice and clean and whatever. So I said, okay, fine. So we booked in with her friend, some sort of mutual friend of ours, who was my hygienist, who was doing her thing in, in my teeth. And then she clipped my gum. Right? She clipped my gum. This is like five days before we're going on holiday. Um, didn't think anything of it, hurt a little bit. A couple of days later, it, it had really swollen up quite bad, like a big ulcer type thing in my mouth. I went back to see her and she said, Will, look, I'm, I'm really sorry. It's got infected um, and I need to put you on these particular antibiotics. But these antibiotics I need to put you on, you cannot drink alcohol on. Now, I don't drink alcohol anymore, but then I used to. I, 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 was, um, I, I wouldn't drink every day, but when I would drink, I would drink a lot and when I was on holiday I'd, so we'd booked this holiday my, my ex-girlfriend and I to go to Mexico Cancun and we had sort of paid the extra for the premium spirits and the upgraded flights and all this I was really looking forward to having 10 days of just drinking and eating and whatever and I, was, I can't believe this I'm not gonna be able to drink on this all inclusive premiums everything included anyway one night on the holiday, we went to a place called Coca Bongos, which is this crazy party place in Cancun. They have midgets swinging from the ceiling, and they have all these acrobatics and all this stuff going on. Um, and it's like a it's like a crazy crazy show um, with music until like four o'clock in the morning. My girlfriend's throwing back tequila like it's going out of fashion, and I wasn't drinking. That night, I literally have to carry her over my shoulder at four o'clock in the morning to put her to bed, wake up in the morning to go out to the pool. She's got her head over the toilet, being sick. And she's like, well, I can't go out into the sun today. I said, well, look, my holiday's been bad enough, not being able to drink. There's no way I'm not going out to drink. So I went with one of my books that I'd taken, which was actually, I don't know if you can see it, that one of the books over there called The Hero by Rhonda Byrne, who was the, the famous author who wrote the book, The Secret, that a lot of people know about the law of attraction, everything. Anyway, I'm reading this book. Now, two years prior to this, I'd made my decision on becoming the world's best life coach. I'd set up a company. I'd set up a company bank account. And I'd said, I'll do it when I'm successful. I'd had this big renewable energy business that we'd just had to close because government changed legislation. We had 85 staff at that point, And we had to literally let it all go overnight. It was, it, it was, it was not good. And I'm reading this, this book. And there's a quote 
by a guy called Mastin Kip. I don't know if you're familiar with Mastin Kip and his work, but he at the time used to have a website called The Daily Love and he used to post an inspirational quote on Twitter every day. Anyway, it says in the hero, Mastin started, he, was, he only had a thousand followers on Twitter, but one day one of his tweets got retweeted by Kim Kardashian and he went from a thousand followers to 10,000 followers overnight. And I just burst out crying again. That's what I call my second lightning moment because in that moment, I was like, Will, you idiot. You don't have to wait until you're successful. You could start by just posting a quote on social media. So that's exactly what I did. I got home. I posted one quote a day on social media. After a week, I was like, Will, you idiot. Some people don't go on social media in the morning. You need to post in the afternoon as well. So I posted a quote in the morning, posted in the afternoon. A week after that, I set up a website. A week after that, so in week three, I set up my own website. Three months after that, I had a 10,000 strong social media following. And then it kind of went, went on from there. So that, that's like the extended version of what you said is, is like, what, what do you do? You just start. So now when you have that big, big, big goal, what I call a North Star, you're exactly right. So many people get caught up with the tyranny of how, well, well, I've got this big goal. It's my dream. How do I take the next step? And I believe in just reverse engineering. It's what I call a North Star trajectory. You have the end goal and then simply put some timeframes on it. So 10 year, five year, three year, one year, 90 day, 30 days, um, this week, today what am i doing this morning and you can break it down into tiny 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 goals my whole business now i've mean, worked for over two thousand people i've done three and a half thousand hours of, of one-on-one coaching alone i've collaborated with some of my heroes and industry legends um we've run over 300 events all started by posting one quote on social media i love that yeah it always starts with that one first step uh could we speak a little bit about that negative self-talk that might be hindering us for from reaching our potential? And, and you have this uh, this what was it? Gremlin bashing. I, I saw you had a video about it, and uh, it would be interesting to hear uh, or get some advice on how we can meet that whenever we want to take those steps, and then that negative self-talk comes back again. Absolutely. So. I think um, so many people, men and women of all different levels of experience and whatever it is they're doing, um, experience negative self-talk. And I think what, what's important is to, a, a few things to understand is that first of all, our brain is programmed to make us to, to, to want to want to make us survive. So 95% of the information that we're, sort of getting in from us is is being uh being used to identify well what's the threats how is this potentially going to kill us you know and, and and stop us from being able to survive but obviously in today's day and age we're not really having to worry about saber-toothed tigers in cages uh, in caves we we can we can control that and we can influence that in 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 a big way so um, if you're someone that is affected a lot by, by negative self-talk, the very first step is being aware of what is it that is the repeated pattern. I'm like the patterns guy. I love learning what are the patterns of behavior that people are thinking about or the actions that they're taking that are regular patterns. So one of the great ways to do that is by journaling and learning what is it that we're saying to ourselves a lot. That's just one example of, of what we can do, but what we can do. But if we want to look at changing that, like I said, I, I use a process called gremlin bashing because most of us have got that little voice in our head that we hear going, you can't do that. You're not good enough. You'll never be as good as them. Um, who do you think you are doing X, Y, Z, right? We've, we've all experienced whatever the, they, they might be saying different things, but most people, if you're listening to this right now or watching this, you'll understand what that is. But one of the things that we can do is we can play with that. So an exercise that I get people to do is a really, really powerful exercise and it really cracks people up. And I highly recommend if you're one of those people, whatever that little voice is, journal down what are some things that you find yourself saying regularly and get a plain piece of paper. And what I want you to do is, is to imagine what does the person, and I say person, I call them a gremlin. What does the gremlin look like that's saying that to you? And, and people go, well, I don't know. I've never thought about that before. And I go, exactly. That's what I want you to think about. Imagine what they would look like. And you, people draw these gremlins. Um, 
in, in all different weird shapes and sizes and different colors. So we look for how um, you draw it out and you'd have this weird looking gremlin and then you go, right, well, is it, how big is it? And you write down, well, it's about, I don't know, 20 centimeters, it's about 20 centimeters. And is it heavy? Um, and and, and we, we describe all of the things in terms of um, how it looks and what weight it is, whether it's moving, whether it's still, we do all of those things. Then what we do is we then write a big speech bubble and we write out what's the thing that it says. So I don't know if it's saying, well, you're not good enough. Let's just use that as an example. So it's saying you're not good enough. And then I get people to go through and identify what, how does it sound? So is it like in a really deep voice or is it a, um, is it a, is it speaking really fast? Is it speaking really slow? And we go through this whole process. We are identifying the submodalities of, of how it operates. Um, once we've done that, then what we start doing is we, we have a bit of fun, right? And what we do when we have a bit of fun is we want to make this gremlin look as stupid as possible and sound as stupid as possible. So if it's, I don't know, let's say it was slimy and it was dark green, well, we're now going to change the color to like a pink. Um, we're going to put it in a little tutu dress. We're going to paint its nails bright red. Um, we're going to give it a little tiara. Um, we, so we just completely play with it. And people are literally drawing this out. Then how it sounds, we can change the voice. So some people change the voice so that it's like a daffy duck sound. Or some people, you know, when you get a helium balloon and you suck a helium balloon and the voice goes really high pitch like this. So they, they'll, they'll start changing that. And they play with all these different modalities. Then what we do is we get them to shrink it right down. Um, if it was really heavy, we'll get them to fill it up with helium and they hold it on to it like it's a little balloon. Anyway, we, we're playing with all these different things. Once people do that exercise and then I say to them, right now, hear your gremlin. And I get them to name the gremlin. So let's say it was Percy, for example, and they, they've named the, per, the ping of Percy and then I get them to give it a silly name. So Percy the pipsqueak as, as, as an example. Hear, hear Percy the pipsqueak saying you're not good enough now. And most people at that point just burst out laughing. I say, why? What's happened? What's, what's going on? They said, well, it's just ridiculous. I would never listen to something so ridiculous. And then from that moment on, whenever they hear that I'm not good enough, they hear it as Percy the Pipsqueak, and then it doesn't affect them anymore. Does it really work? Have you tried it? Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've done this with dozens and dozens and dozens of people. If, if you just think about it, it doesn't work. You have to do the exercise, right? You go through it, you do the exercise, you get your coloring pens out, you play with it, you change all these modalities, and, and then you look at it, and then you say, Percy the Pips, with I'm, I'm not good enough. And people are like, it just doesn't affect me anymore. So that's that's just one way of being able to to change that um, uh to, to change that that way that our inner dialogue is affecting us is, is get first of all is what's the awareness so what is it it's saying then we alter it so we interrupt the pattern so we identify the pattern we then interrupt the pattern then we replace the pattern with something else and then we find all of a sudden that that doesn't affect us anymore so that that's one way of uh, there's, there's obviously there's lots of different ways of dealing with negative self-talk but that's that's one way of dealing with it that's really uh, powerful. Thank you for sharing that. That's really like spot on. Uh, it's su such great with tools, you know, uh, that we can practice. Uh, I really believe it's all about practice. W what do you think is holding people back from reaching their potential? Uh, we speak a lot about purpose in Wisdom from North, uh, and I'm very passionate about purpose. And uh, I believe it's not necessarily that we have one specific purpose. I, I think a purpose can grow, a purpose can change, but I do think that there is some sort of a blueprint and a potential that we have, and we have free will, so we can choose to step into it or not, and a purpose can grow from there even. Um, and it has to do with really opening up to uh, more of what's inside of you and uh, start the spiritual journey, uh, because I don't think we can find our purpose inside our comfort zone or our conditioned box. So we sort of need to expand our consciousness to open up to our purpose. But what in your perspective is holding most people back? Like it could be ne negative self-talk, but is there something else that you see that is holding people back? 
It's, it's a really good question. So what, one of the things that I've, I've tried to do in all of the different modalities that I've studied, everything from NLP to stoicism to quantum physics, you, across, across the spectrum, one of the things that I try and do is simplify things as best as I can. And my, my whole coaching methodology now revolves around three things, which is clarity, action and accountability. So for, for me is that for people to achieve their full potential, they need absolute clarity. They need to take intelligent action and they need to have an active accountability. So absolute clarity is knowing what you're doing, um, why you're doing it and having some form of trajectory, North Star trajectory to, to be able to achieve it. Intelligent action is action that's being taken aligned with your goals and your values. So a lot of people, they talk about massive action, take massive action. Personally, I think that sometimes that can be detrimental if it's not aligned with your values and your goals. So hence why I refer to intelligent action and an active accountability isn't just telling someone that you're going to do something. It's having someone that you've told that you're going to do something and you've got a fixed time in a date when you're going to be checking up with them and they're going to be checking up with you to make sure stuff gets done. So in, in answer to your question, what do I believe that holds people back is them not having absolute clarity, not taking intelligent action, not having a active accountability. And for me, I, absolute clarity consists of a purpose absolutely like like you mentioned and I'll, I'll share my opinion on that in a second and and having the mission so for me the the mission is what you're doing and the purpose is why you're doing it so there, there are two things because every everyone um has a purpose i don't believe personally that you find your purpose i believe that you create it or certainly you have the the, the ability to create it and the, the clarity piece that comes into that. So using my personal story that I shared a, a moment ago, it was in that moment of insight eight years ago when, when Tony was sharing the, the, um, the Thanksgiving story that I gained the clarity that gave me the, um, the of, of me to truly understand my purpose that I hadn't seen before. So it was like an unraveling for me in, in that moment. Um, and then I created my mission. And that mission, as you've said, it can evolve and develop and grow. And it has done and will continue to do so as, as time goes on. But um, I, I think that, that that clarity piece is, is really, really key. And you, you mentioned the word consciousness. For me, consciousness is, is just awareness, right? And we gain awareness from but becoming clear when we become clear and we, that can come from having coaching it can come from listening to inspiring stories we, we we just get that moment of insight and then it's like right yep i'm i'm, I'm clearer now i can move forward and 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 great questions help with that you know i, I think uh um but but if having great quality questions enables us to come up with great quality answers and um, and that helps people to become more 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 aware. Uh, could it be helpful to to uh, focus on what you don't want? Like I think there is a technique where it's like this is what I don't want. I don't want to live like this or work like this, and and then find out what you actually do want by looking at what you don't want. <laughs> yeah. So I I I, I, I joke with people about this. I, I play with them a little bit. So I have people that get on a call with me and they say, Will, I, 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 I really want to do something different in my life. Um, I don't want to be doing what I'm doing at the moment. And I go, okay, cool. And what would you love to be doing? And they said, Will, I would do anything. I would do anything. And I'm like, okay. And this is where I have fun with them. Okay, fine. So um, I, I'm going to put a phone call into the council now and I'm going to get you a job starting tomorrow as a binman taking doing going around in the rubbish truck and and, and doing the, the, the no 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 no, no I, I, don't, I don't want to do that i go okay cool um so we've established that that's something you don't want to do so we're now we've got clear there's one thing you definitely don't want to do i say right fine um um i'm gonna get you um a a a job as a um uh you're, you're gonna be working in a factory and you're going to be working a hundred hours a week <laughs> right and they go no no no. that's the, i definitely don't want that i'm like ah oh, right so now we're getting somewhere so by you telling me what you don't want we can start to get clearer on what it is that you do want 
So let's start broad. So there's a over here we have a toy. It's, it's, it's a kid's toy. It's known as a shape sorter. I'm sure you've got them over there as well. Wherever the people are listening in the world, they've got them. And, and typically it's like a cube. And the cube will have like triangle holes in it and circle holes in it and square holes in it. And the, 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 the idea is that the children put the circle peg in the circle hole and the square peg in the square hole and so on and so forth and that's essentially what we're doing we start to play with all well, let's let's identify what, what do you absolutely not want well i don't want to be working for somebody else i don't want to be working um i, I don't want to be earning minimum wage um i i don't want to not be able to travel um and we uh, and we make that list because some people again they're so conditioned to looking for what they don't want fine start with that because that can help us shape and create what it is that we do want because again there'll be patterns well i don't want to work for someone i don't want to work in this job don't want to work in this job don't want to work in this job but i do want to be able to travel i do want to be able to earn a certain amount of money and when we start playing with those we we, we end up getting a narrower and narrower um pool of things that could be done and then we we link it in with that so that's that's part of the process for people for yeah sure. That makes sense because get, getting that clarity, I think already there, a lot of people are stopping. Like, yeah, I need clarity, but I don't have clarity, right? So it's always good to start somewhere. Like you say, and, narrowing and, it. Well, yeah, yeah. narrowing it. But the key here is to start broad. So when, when you talk about the North Star, some people, so we've got two types of people. We've got the people that do know their North Star, but they're not taking action. That's because they've not got granular enough. But then you've got other people that, um, that, that they haven't gone broad enough. Because once we go broad, then we can always bring it back in. So in, in NLP terms, we'd call it chunking. So you chunk up or chunk down. But um, you, if, if, you, if you're struggling... I, I would highly recommend start chunking up and 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 go broader to then bring it back and you, you'll be amazed at the difference that it can make if you find yourself getting stuck or hitting a bit of a roadblock makes sense um and you also love to study different uh things uh, uh you you mentioned you know nlp and quantum physics and you just mentioned before we started this that you you're interested in light and how that is information mm. uh, I, i've heard that before actually let's go there let's talk about light okay so i i i have these these I call them inspired thoughts and I, I typically get them, well, I say in two places, but really it's one place. I typically get them with running water. I don't know why. So I get them in the shower or if I'm running by the river or running by the sea, I, I have these inspired thoughts. And about five years ago, I had this thought, what if light is knowledge? What is light? If, if, so when, when I say knowledge, not, not, I mean knowledge, information, um, um, uh, consciousness, you know, whatever the, the term is that you want to use. What, what if light is knowledge? And the, the reason I thought this is that take, take a radio, okay? So a, a normal radio um, has a transmitter and it has a receiver, you transmit up receiver if you are tuned into the same radio um, wave you know you're on the same station then the receiver will hear what the transmitter is what what's coming from the transmitter and and one day i just thought to myself like one of the when as you do sort of pondering life um and, and the meaning of life and all that good stuff is that what what if so Again, coming back in, so I want to bring it back a little bit. So I, I believe that the universe is and everything is expanding to contract. So um, I, I can't really, let me draw this out so you can kind of see it. Is that in energy, I, I believe, will kind of start out like this. Um, and I'll show this up in a I'll show this up in a moment. So we, we kind of start like this. So let, let's let's assume this was the Big Bang, right? I know there's going to be different theories, but we get to a point where then it starts to contract again, right? So then we start to contract again, and then it comes out again, and then it contracts again, and so and so on and so forth. So we end up having something look like this. 
And I kind of thought to myself, what, what if the sun is, 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 is condensed all that information and it's sharing that information out and wants it to, to keep going? And then there's certain um, receivers, i.e. us, that have the ability to take that information so far and then expand it out even further. A little bit like how, um, you, know, you know how you have electricity pylons, you know whether you have the electricity and it goes to the next pylon, next pylon, it's a little bit like that. And what, what was really interesting is that when, when you think of some of the language that we use subconsciously, right? We, we use the light terms. So if someone is really smart, you'd typically say they are bright. If someone's a bit stupid, we'd call them, they're a bit dim, right? And, and, and I was just thinking about this, and there's, there's loads and loads of examples of, of when we do that. Um, I've had a light bulb moment, is we've had a new idea. You've, you've got, I'm, I'm in the dark, is I don't know. And we've got all of this terminology that we've we've used and, and we typically use subconsciously without even realizing. And um, and, and it becomes really, really, really interesting. Now, what, what I also think is that then when you start looking into the physics side of things, I, I believe in, 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 in doing our best to live in equilibrium and living in a state of gratitude. Now, if you're living in a state of gratitude, a lot of people think that gratitude is about being really happy all the time and things being more, but it's not. Being, being in a state of gratitude, in my opinion, is being at equilibrium, which is being able to see the positive in the negative and the negative in the positive. It's not having a one-sided bias. Now, when we do that and we live in a state of gratitude, we feel enlightened, right? So again, using one of these terms that we use subconsciously, when, when you learn new information, go, ah, oh, you've enlightened me enlightened you're enlightened and it's, it's all of these the, these these things that we kind of do without realizing when we're gaining this new information now what what's also really interesting is that when how how electricity is created if you look into how electricity is created is, is, is created is that when you have the the appropriate molecules that that, that come to um Sorry, when you, when you when electricity is created and, and light is created, it's also when you get this perfect balance, and that's when when kind of lights created as well. So I, I think it's it's just really really interesting. How do we become the receiver while we're getting to balance, and then we can receive that information in any given moment when when we want that. I'm sure lots of your 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 audience that listen to this, they've had those enlightening moments, they've had those great realizations, they've had those aha moments. And they've typically happened when they get into a state of gratitude. And, and that's when I feel that um, it can be, yeah, it can be very interesting indeed. So um, yeah, that's, that's that. Nice. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, so uh, just at the end of the interview here, can you share a little bit about how you create and manifest? Have, I saw you have the, the secret behind you and you, you mentioned that book and um do you use gratitude and uh, the law of attraction very consciously in your own creation, like these uh, sort of spiritual concepts? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, for, for me, the, a, a lot of the law of attraction comes down to two things, which is, yes, it, there's thinking positively, and I want to think positively, but it's also about thinking um uh it's all about feeling as well right so a lot of people they might think positively but they're not they're not feeling it in the moment which we use gratitude to get into feeling how we want to feel and th there's two very simple ways to, to basically be grateful you can get what you want or you can want what you have right and, and and that becomes really powerful when you when you want what you have and you can be grateful for everything you've got in any given moment then that that does truly become really powerful but what i also think is really important and this is that in my experience the number one reason the number one reason and it's particularly prominent in women in my experience um that, that have this i mean it impacts everybody but particularly women um, is that when they, they, they think about manifestation, they, they're doing all of the right things, right? They're, they're, they're visualizing, they're doing affirmations, they're writing down goals, they're, 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 they're getting present, they're, 
they're, they're thinking the way that they, how they want to think. They've done their vision board. They've done all these things, but they fall at the final hurdle. And the final hurdle is typically their deserve level. And when people don't feel that they deserve something, they won't get it. Or if they do get it, they won't have it for very long. And do how do we change that? Because that's a, such a deep, deep rooted belief. Yeah. So feelings of worth, self-worth, and um and, and deserving level are typically associated with guilt and shame so shame is when you perceive that you've caused more negative than positive to yourself and guilt is when you perceive that you've caused more negative than positive to someone else and we can create equilibrium. So again, when we're experiencing any negative emotion, in my opinion, any negative emotion that we ever experience is as a result, well, any negative emotion is, is simply a signal. That's it, right? It's a signal to think or act differently. And it, it's our body's way of saying, hello, wake up, Will. You, you need to be thinking or acting differently. And obviously how we think or act differently will determine on what we're going to do. And when we're experiencing any form of shame and guilt, it's because we have a lopsided perspective. So again, it comes back to this process of gratitude. When we get into gratitude, we then won't have the, um, the feelings of guilt or shame anymore. So that's, that's the process, the whole process that I go through, a very, very simple process that enables people. And, and I've done this with, again, dozens and dozens of people. And the stuff that happens when they go through this process in literally, I've got stories of um, a client of mine this year. Um, she's got a big gardening business and they had they needed one of those big sit on tractor lawn mowers. She did this process and almost I think it was like within 24 hours, she and her father, was it her father or father in law? I can't remember. I think it was her father had won this six thousand pound sit on lawn mower, the exact one that she wanted because she'd done this process. Um, I've got another example. Uh, so also long term financial challenge. So what I call chronic financial challenge is also linked to guilt and shame. And I had a, a, a woman that did this process who um, I, I won't mention names for, for, for obvious reasons, but we established that she was in a, a, a debt and pretty much the same week that she got into debt was the same week she had an abortion. And for years later, she'd been in this, all this debt. And we did the, I call it a collapse process. So we did the collapse process on her having this abortion that she had the guilt and shame around. And then literally the next week, it was within the next week. So it happened on the Saturday. This happened on the Tuesday. So four days, she got a, um, a, a tax rebate from the government that cleared her debt. You know, now some people say, well, that's just a coincidence. I don't believe in coincidences. I believe there are no, co so co there are no coincidences. There's only synchronicities. And I've got dozens and dozens and dozens of these examples. And that's how people do it. And one, one other way that people can do it is by um, creating what I call a boast list. So this is a really practical way of, of people doing it. So a lot of people, when they hear the term boast, is that they don't want to be boastful. Because if you're boastful, that's bad. Sorry, what is boastful? Bo boastful is being sort of overconfident, cocky, too proud, um, arrogant ab about something that they've done. And But the etymology of the word boast, the root origin meaning of the word boast means to inflate, right? But people use it in the context of to overinflate. But if you think of your, your tires on your car, if you pump your tires up too much, what's going to happen to them? Yeah. They... What, what would happen to your tires? They'd, they'd burst, well, right? So if we, we and it, it, would, it would be no good. But equally, if your tires aren't pumped up enough, if you don't have hardly any air in them and you try and drive, what happens to the tires? Yeah, they are destroyed or get destroyed. yeah exactly they, they get destroyed and they get destroyed really quickly now all tires eventually get destroyed but you you wouldn't get as many miles out of them and it's exactly the same so what a lot of people are doing is they haven't inflated themselves up enough to operate at an optimal 
um, a, 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 in an optimal way. In the same way that when you have your tires, you can have your tire not inflated enough or you can have it overinflated. Either way, it's not going to work. So what we're looking for is the optimal amount of, of inflation, if you like, about ourselves. So a really powerful exercise that people can do is go back through all of the years, even from when they were a kid and they did their five meter swimming badge or whatever it is, and write down all of the achievements that they've ever done, no matter whether anyone else thought it was an achievement or not, but every single achievement, and they could think of achievements in their family life, like having a child, making sure their child went to school on time, like small things, big things in their career, in their social life, um, you, you name it, right? All, all these things, the, the houses, cars, material things, it doesn't matter, put, put it on this list. And it's a really powerful exercise. Typically, I get people to do 150 to 200 things that they've just forgotten about that they do that are significant achievements. And the feeling of self-worth that you have and the self-confidence that it gives you by focusing your attention on things that you've already done when it comes to moving forward is is it, it can be truly life-changing for people so yeah that's that's a couple of ways of being able to do it that's great there's so many practical tips here that you're sharing and i love what you said about gratefulness that you actually use that very consciously uh, to receive that equilibrium uh, i haven't thought about it through that perspective and i just wanted to ask you so when you use gratefulness uh, do you wake up in the morning and you think about things that you're grateful for? And is it also that you're thanking for the hardship in your life? Because I've heard that perspective, like, thank you. Like, let's say you were in a breakup, like a horrible breakup. Thank you so much for this breakup for, uh, yeah, I, I know that it's um, for the greater good or um yeah, can, can you just share a little bit about Absolutely. that? Absolutely. I'll, I'll do that. And I, I want to draw two things out to also put a bit of context to this, because I think they're really important visuals that will help people. So if you're listening to this, then you're going to have to come to the YouTube channel and watch it. But if you're watching the YouTube, you'll see this in a moment. So let, let's talk about gratitude. So um, positive, good, happy, and then let's take sad, bad, negative, right? So hopefully you can see this. So you've got happy, good and positive at one end of the spectrum. And then the other end of the spectrum, you've got sad, bad and negative, right? They're into the spectrum. Now, what most people do is they kind of swing. Right. So most people kind of swing from one pendulum to the next pendulum to the next pendulum. Whereas what, what we want to do, and this is what the gratitude process is doing, if I use a different color here to, 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 to draw this out. When, when we're doing the gratitude process, what we're doing is we're evening out these, these changes because we're seeing the positive in the negative, the negative in the positive, and so on and so forth. Now, what's interesting is it's this part here in the middle is that when we're in the state of gratitude, when we're at equilibrium. Yeah, so that's what we're looking at doing. And that's where we really want to get to. Now, the other side, the other example of this is when we're talking about gratitude is that, and, and we're looking at getting to equilibrium. So I'm going to draw out my very terrible drawing here, um, balance scales, right? So typical balance scales that go up and down that use for weight. If I had a brick on one end of the balance scales and I had a tiny grain of sand on the other, the brick would weigh a lot more than the grain of sand, you'd agree right? But if I keep adding lots and lots of little grains of sand and eventually end up with this big pile of grains of sand, right? Eventually, I'm going to add one tiny extra little bit of grain of sand. And then what's going to happen is my, my grain of sand is going to move here and the brick's going to move here because they're now up and they're at equilibrium. And it works exactly the same because whilst quantitatively, you might have to have and, and again, typically when I do this process with people, it's between 100 and sometimes many as 300, but normally between 150, 100, 150 reasons to get people into balance because we look for all of the small little um, the, the benefits or sometimes the negatives, right? We're looking for the drawbacks as well. And we look for the primary benefit, the secondary benefit and the tertiary benefits. The primary benefit 
would be something that's gone well. The secondary benefit is the benefit of that first benefit. And the tertiary benefit is the benefit of the second benefit. So we're, we're going deeper. And generally, when we look at the secondary and tertiary benefits, the weight in this instance of the grain of sand or the weight of the benefit generally gets heavier. Right. So that's why we go deep and we look in this area. I, I normally get people to do this exercise again as a, as a practical a tool for your listeners to use. I get them to look in the seven key areas of life. So they look in um, their family life. They look in their health and fitness. They look in their um, social life. They look in their relationships. They look in their in their own sort of attitude and, 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 and sort of mental well-being. Um, they look in their career or their business and um, that they're, they're looking in those areas. And then I get them to typically look in their three highest values, the things that are most important for them. And they do five, but then obviously they do primary, secondary and tertiary. So each five ends up becoming 15 in all those key areas. And that's how they really quickly get to, to that. And that gets them to equilibrium. So, um, so that's that. Now, as for gratitude, yeah, so I, I do use gratitude daily. And I use a process called PEBEP. It's an acronym, P-E-B-E-P, sorry, P-E-B-E-P, which stands for, so I think about the day before. So yesterday I did this, it, uh, let me say this morning, I, I wrote it out my, uh, in my, my little journal here. I put it right here. You can't read my, my hieroglyphics. Right, writing out my 10 things that I was grateful for yesterday. So I think about people. I think about experiences that I had. I think about belongings. I think about um, expectations and privileges. So people, I might say, right, well, I'm grateful for um, um, being able to play tennis with my dad, which was something that I did yesterday. Now, a another example, when you talk about things that didn't go so well. So I am grateful. This happened last week. I was driving up. And I'm grateful for the car driver that pulled out in front of me. And I had to swerve my car and I nearly crashed, um, but they just pulled out in front of me. Now people go, Will, why on earth would you be grateful for that car driver pulling out in front of you? I was grateful that he pulled out the second that he did. Because if he had pulled out a second later, he would have gone straight into the side of me. Right. So that's that's an example of it. Um, um, an example of something that maybe wouldn't have gone so well um, would be. Um, so. Um, what What's an, an example that I could use? Um, have, have you got something that's not gone so well for you recently? I could use it as, a, as an example. Well, I mean, well, if you're getting sick, you know, if uh, you've lost someone, lost your job, something like that, you know, brilliant, break up brilliant, or... brilliant, brilliant. So the, 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 the first one, so let, let's use all those examples. So getting sick. And a few years ago, um, I, I was skating down the ice and I took a, I took a shot. And as I took a shot, the, the, one of the players on their team, who was uh, a bit of a goon, a bit of an enforcer, came and, and put his stick across. I, I was skating at full speed. He was skating at full speed. After I shot the puck, put his stick across my face, hit my visor, broke my nose really badly. I got knocked out, went face down onto the ice, knocked out. My lip got stuck to the ice and whilst I was out, blood everywhere. My, my nose was over here. My septum was over here, like completely flat across my face. Had to, to go to the hospital and the doctor said, yep, your nose is broken. I thought, yep, thanks, doc. That's pretty obvious. I needed to look in the mirror um, to see that one. Uh, and then I had to have what they call an MUA, which is a manipulation under anaesthetic, which I had a few days later under general anaesthetic. And it didn't really do anything. And they said, we're going to have to book you in for an, an operation that you're not going to be able to have for about a year. And to, to put it into perspective, I only had about 15% breathing out of one nostril, right? So I had to become a mouth breather. I couldn't, it was so uncomfortable. It was horrible. Anyway, I wanted to really hurt this guy. I was so angry. I was so angry. So I haven't come out of the hospital. I said, nope, I will. I need to do the gratitude exercise. So I sat down with my pen and my paper and I wrote out 10 reasons I was grateful that I had my nose broken. So I thought about things that I was grateful for that happened to me and not one of the younger players on the team. I was grateful for the NHS, which is our sort of national health service over here. So I didn't have to pay for the, the cover. 
I was grateful for the fact that um, I was only knocked out for a sort of 20 seconds or so and I wasn't knocked out for long. I was grateful for the fact that it only broke my nose and didn't break my jawbone or it wasn't any worse. Um, and then I, I read up my 10 things and I, I pictured this guy and I was still fuming and I still wanted to really, really go back and hurt him. So I said, right, I'll read out 25 reasons. I read out 25 reasons why I'm grateful, went deeper and deeper. And I sat there, I said his name, and I still wanted to go and get this guy. So I write out um, 50 reasons why I'm grateful for this happening. I'm really having to dig deep now. And I sat there, I thought about him. I still wanted to go and get this guy. So I said, right, that's it. I'm going to write 150 reasons. I write 150 reasons why I'm grateful for this happening. And I sat there and I pictured this guy, thought about his name, nothing. I was at peace about it, All right? Now here's where it gets interesting. About a year and a half later, I get a message from this guy. Now, I always used to start my video saying, hi, it's Will Post and make it happen. And all of my friends used to take the mickey out of me. So when I would turn up at the rugby club, they'd be like, oh, it's Will Post and make it happen. Come in. And I thought this guy was about to do the same. He, so he mentioned me, Will, I've been watching your videos, he said. And he said, I just wanted to let you know you've inspired me. And I thought, this is interesting. Where's this going? And he said, well, I don't know if you know, but the current owner of the team has left the team. And, and if someone doesn't take over, there's going to be no adults. There's going to be dozens of adults that are not able to play ice hockey in North London. And there's going to be hundreds of kids that are not going to be able to play for the junior academy. But your videos have inspired me to want to take over the team and run it. So I just wanted to say thank you. And in that moment, I just sat back and went, wow. Wow. Because if I hadn't have done that process and I hadn't have done those 150 reasons and got to being at peace with it, which I was getting to being at peace for my benefit, I would have blocked this guy on Facebook so I didn't get triggered whenever I saw his name. I would have made sure that I hadn't seen him ever again. I would have probably done something when I did see him in an ice hockey game that was a form of retaliation. And that may never have happened. So as a result, the way I kind of see it now is that as a result of me doing the gratitude process, there's dozens of adults in North London and hundreds of kids that are able to play hockey that may not have been able to otherwise. So that's, again, where the, the synchronicity of it all comes into play um, of, of just one of my personal experiences with, with gratitude. So, yeah, I, I think it's hugely, hugely beneficial. I absolutely think that you can you can do it for the um, the, 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 the negatives and like I said before you've you've got two ways you can either get what you want or you can want what you have and um, if if you can want what you have while striving for what you want then you, you can have the best of both worlds and uh, in using that process so I didn't quite finish sorry my, my fault so people experiences belongings like anything you have so for me I might say right well I'm I'm, I'm grateful for my laptop that's enabling me to do this this uh, podcast interview. I'm grateful for the fact that the internet has stayed on. Uh, actually, that would be an expectation. So my expectation is that the internet would, is going to hold out throughout this podcast. I interviewed someone on my podcast a few weeks ago, and it didn't. It kept cutting out. I'm sure you've had it before, and it can be a real inconvenience when it does, right? Um, so expectation and privileges. So for me, I'm, I'm very privileged that um, I was able to um, drive to work this morning. I'm privileged that I'm able to have heating in the office here today. And I think about the things that we forget about, you know, the things that actually, if they didn't happen that day, would have caused you a bit of an inconvenience, like remembering your keys, the car starting, the fact that the toilet flushed, you know, all the things that if they hadn't have happened, would have, would, would have, would have been an annoyance, if nothing else. Um, it, it, thinking about those things consciously can can create a beautiful state of of just being because of of things that have that are that are happening so yeah that's uh my, my view on gratitude wow Th this has been really really inspiring you have shared so many golden nuggets and uh, so many concrete tips for everybody today and i I hope people out there are really excited and inspired to practice gratitude. And uh, 
there's so many tools, but I think gratitude is one of the most powerful. So thank you for reminding us again and uh, sharing some techniques on how we can do it. And uh, you can, guys, you can always rewind and watch this again, because I felt there were so many things that you said that I want to write down. So I'm definitely going to go back watch this again and test some of these uh, techniques out and people can find you on your website. I'm going to put that below. Thank you so much, Will. Is there anything you want to uh, share at the end? No, I just want to share my, my, my gratitude and thanks to you. I'm, I'm really grateful for you doing this and your, your videos on YouTube are incredible. And, and I'm absolutely honored to be able to be a guest and, and being able to contribute. So thank you so much for having me and uh, yeah, I look forward to speaking soon. Thank you. And thank you so much for watching, everybody. Much light from the UK and Norway. Bye-bye.